Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, Clayton here from XY Advisor, chatting to Jordan from the Perth Mint. Mate, thank you for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Clayton. Of course. Um, so what I was just about to tell you before, before we hit record, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned this after we hit record, is uh, I've mentioned to you briefly in the past that I used to be a bit of a gold bug um, and that uh, I, I used to put all my clients at varying degrees of their portfolio. I used to allocate to, to gold. And I dipped into my um, my superannuation for the first time in a while. I, I went to check it out. I hadn't checked it out in a while. Um, so I, I'd completely forgotten, but I had 10% of the money in the ETF, the gold ETF, right? And then funnily enough, I had a lot of it unhedged and I actually hadn't really lost any money just because the way that I invest is contrarian by nature anyway. Uh, and, and it points in these black swan events, which I tend to call the decade <laughs> event. <laughs> these, these, these never in a million year events just tend to happen every 10 years. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I always had a lot of respect for um, a bunch of investors that are out there and they, they constantly refer to the preservation of capital is very important as, as is making money as well. And it's kind of interesting, you know, gold lives in this, weird bucket and i'd like to discuss it from a financial planning point of view because you you work for the perth mint you're obviously very exposed to it you're very bullish on gold as as a personal investor as well and all of this has worked in your favor recently let's face it right like uh, gold's done quite well um so uh, we've got a few things that i want to cover but how do you there's two views of gold right one is it's a hedge. And when people say that, I don't even think they really understand what that means. It's, you know, if you, if you were to interpret gold as a hedge, what that actually means is when everything else goes down, this goes up, but technically you should then sell it when it goes up and then invest it into the other stuff. And then as everything else rises, sell that and then buy more gold in, in rather than just having a static amount of gold in a portfolio as if it is a hedge, if it is a true hedge, you should use it as the hedge and you know, buy and sell at the right times. Um, and then the other one is as the Warren Buffett point of view, it's a metal in the ground, you dig up, turn it into a block and stick it back in the ground, right? So I want to know where does gold sit for you? How do you summarize gold? It's a, it's a really great question, um, Clayton, to, to start with. So I think for me personally, and, and obviously I've, I've read the Buffett critique, as it were, um, you know, gold is, is like any other asset in, this, in, in, in respect that it has positive and sort of imperfect qualities about it as well as an investment. So, you know, from the perspective of an individual investor or a financial advisor trying to help someone with their portfolio, um, gold should just be looked at like any other asset class, cash, bonds, equities, you name it. And it's about getting the, the balance right in, in the portfolio. So, you know, you mentioned before um, with it being a hedge and, and looking at sort of selling it after it's rallied and then buying back in maybe when it's a little bit cheaper. I mean, obviously, if you can do that well consistently, that would be, you know, the best approach for any asset. Yeah. Um, it's obviously not that easy to do. Although one of the things that I think is is really interesting um, for investors to, to sort of think about and planners maybe to think about as well is that, you know, if let, let's say, for example, and I think you mentioned yourself, um, you know, roughly 10% of your portfolio. Mm. You know, if you started, to, if, if, it, if at the end of December 2019, you had 10% of your money in gold and you did nothing for a quarter, probably by the end of the quarter, it would have been closer to 15 to 20% because gold had rallied and equities had sold off. Yes. So it might not even be that you say, okay, look, I'm going to try and perfectly time when I get all of my money in or out of this asset or indeed any other asset. But if you sort of work towards like rebalancing your portfolio, um, so you go, oh, maybe, you know, my gold exposure or my equities exposure has gone beyond where it would normally be. 
that's actually a good thing because it, you know, it's, 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 it's a reflection of the fact that gold rallied and did its job yeah. protecting my portfolio and, and now I'll rebalance. And, and I know, for, for example, uh, a couple of um, uh, funds in Australia that, that, that do that. So they have these kind of strategic gold allocations within their portfolio. But once it kind of moves beyond a certain band, they actually, they actually sell. They, they don't, even if they think, oh, look, I'm bullish on gold for the next three months or six months or whatever, their, their perspective is, well, you know, it's gone from being X percent of my portfolio to, you know, X plus 5%. That, that's now too much. There's too much risk in, in, from a portfolio perspective. So I'm going to rebalance. So I think that's, that's something to keep in mind. If, if we can talk through the Buffett one, and it's one that I've been asked <laughs> about obviously a lot over the last 15 yes. years. Yes. And if I could maybe, I suppose, provide my retort to it, if that's Please. useful. Yeah. And, and maybe even something for advisors to think about with their conversations with their clients. So Buffett is technically correct in that, yeah, gold is this inert, you know, physical metal. Um, it's, not, um, it's not productive in the sense that it produces, you know, a good or service like a, like a company does. Um, but the, so, so let's, let's acknowledge that, right? Let's say, okay, well, look, Warren's obviously the, the best investor there's ever been and his point is, is accurate. But that, then let's explore it a little bit deeper. So what, what Warren says in 2020, and indeed he's been saying it for years and years and years, what he says in 2020 about gold was just as accurate to say in 1971, right? Because gold hasn't changed in the last 50 years. Gold hasn't changed in the last 5,000 years, mm -hmm. right? So the, the thing that I would say an investor should think about or a financial planner should think about is they should then say, well, okay, it may be, it may be true that gold kind of doesn't do anything as it were. But what is also true is that the price of gold from 1971 to today has risen by roughly 9% per annum in Aussie dollar, US dollar terms. It'll, it'll depend a little bit which currency we're talking about, but let's call it you know, around 9% per annum, right? The market value of all the gold that exists in the world today is over $10 trillion. So that's five times the size of the ASX and roughly 20 times the size of the Australian bond market, right? Huh. If, if gold was a sovereign bond market, it would be the third biggest bond market in the world, right? It'd, it'd be just behind... Uh, the Japanese market and, and, and US Treasury market. Turnover in the gold market is around $100, $150 billion a day, right? So that's, again, more than 20 times the, the volume of trading we see in the ASX, for, for example. Um, and if we look back at the last 50 years, and, and this plays into the comment you made earlier about gold being a hedge, if you look at every month or quarter or calendar year where equities sell off, history will tell you that there has been no better asset to own than gold as a hedge in those environments. It's on average gone up by more than just keeping cash in the bank and on average gone up even more than holding bonds or, or fixed income securities. So what I'd say then is if like, let's put all these, these thoughts together. You say, okay, well, if this asset is useless, right? which is essentially the way that people interpret Buffett's statement. He doesn't actually say that, but that's what people effectively take from it. If the asset is useless, why have, why have human beings decided, right, that they are going to bid up the price of it such that it's risen by, as I say, roughly 8% per annum uh, for 50 years? Why have human beings assigned a market capitalization to this asset of over $10 trillion? Why do they trade over $100 billion of it a day and why, in periods where equities are weak, do they gravitate to this asset class more than they do to anything else, right? So the, the only answer is that whether you agree with it personally or not, humanity has decided that it values gold. <laughs> You're right, yes. Right? Yes. Like, that is, that is unquestionable. And if you think that, okay, this asset also has a track record that dates back, you know, five to six millennia, I think the onus should really be more on people to disprove why gold is valuable rather than, than, rather than prove that it is because the history speaks for itself. It is such a simple yet compelling argument that the only, the only reason that gold has value is simply because we've decided it has over thousands of years. I mean, obviously, there's a couple of additional qualities to it. It's impossible to create, um, you know, things like that, uh, which... which restrict supply um and so 
there are a couple of, and it's not a highly common metal and, and there are a couple of other things, but if you think about how strange humanity is in making decisions we all agree on anyway, think about Coca-Cola. If I walked up, let's say Coca-Cola didn't exist and I walked up to you and I said, Hey Jordan, I got this idea for a drink. It's brown, <laughs> right? I'm going to put lots of bubbles in it. It's going to taste a little bit orangey and a little bit like cinnamon, but we can't quite figure out what it tastes like. What do you reckon? You'd be like, no, mate, it's a horrible idea for a drink. And yet Coca-Cola is one of the most valuable brands in the world. It's one of the most drinked drinks in the world. Uh, And we all made a a decision to value Coca-Cola, right? Now, that goes, that sort of flies in the face of rational behavior. But I think it's well and truly, um, we've moved past the concept that humans only make the most rational decision. And yet, for some reason, gold is held up to prove itself to be, uh, to, to, to give a rational explanation. Now, I guess that's why um, because it lives in the world of investments and investments love, you know, all the calculations underneath and they, there's a level of, a large level of transparency um, and there's quite a high level of research into this sort of stuff. And then with gold, it's just essentially non-existent. You might be able to learn a little bit about demand and supply. There's, there's, there's probably a singular uh uh, you know, ratio that's interesting. How many people are buying? How many people are selling? But that's it. There's no dividend. There's, there's no balance sheet. There's no dividends. Yeah. There's no sales yeah. strategy. Yeah. It's not, it's not trying to, you know, disintermediate it or disrupt anything. <laughs> it's, it's just a yellow metal that humans have valued for millennia. Yeah. yeah. I, I, look, I think, it's, I think it's a good point. And, and funnily enough, um, in a lot of ways, I, I think that's part of the reason why certain sections of the market um, are less, uh, I suppose, uh, predisposed to, towards accepting gold in, in a portfolio because you've, you know, and, and look, my background, um, you know, I've, I've worked in asset management for the majority of my life, even though I've had um, a, a fairly sizable sort of personal allocation to gold for over 15 years now. Um, so, yeah, you know, you're, you're used to analysing yield curves and you want to look at credit spreads and you want to look at, earnings per share and, you know, growth, growth trajectories for, you know, disruptive fintechs or for, um, you know, I don't don't know, obviously Facebook and and the Googles and the Amazons of the world aren't aren't startups by any means anymore, but, you know, 20 (laughs) years ago or even less in some cases they were. So yeah, look, it it makes sense why, um, you know, people that like to, um, and I've, you know, inverted commas, invest and and analyze markets and, and, and trends why gold almost just wouldn't even be on the radar because it's just gold, as, as, as it were. Hmm. Um, but as I say, that, that doesn't change the fact that it actually does have these in- incredibly valuable qualities that it can bring to, uh, to investors. And so I, I suppose in the last seven or eight years that I've worked directly in the gold space, the majority of people that I speak to, uh, uh, you know, there's sort of the mum and dad investor, there's the SMSF trustee, um, there's then the, the intermediaries, the, the planners, and then there's a little bit of institutional wealth as well. Um, and, and the funny thing is that the, I would say that the market that it's adopting at the fastest is very much the kind of SMSF self-directed uh, investor market. And, you know, that, that to me makes sense because if you look at their portfolios, They've tended to have fairly high allocations to cash, fairly high allocations to Aussie equities. Um, but they also like investing in what I would call relatively vanilla investments that they understand, right? So, you know, most, most SMSFs, and I, I don't want to speak out of school and, and say all, um, but most of them, you know, they're not going into hedge funds or private equity or venture capital or a lot of these other sort of alternative assets that are, you know, they're on the table for institutional investors, um, but, the, but they're not really things that SMSF trustees want to buy. They, they, they prefer to buy something that they can trade via the ASX, um, ideally, 
um, or in the case of gold, like, you know, we have a product on the ASX that they can buy, but of course you can open an account and, and trade directly with the Perth Mint. Um, so for, for them, g- gold makes sense and it's easy to get because they, they understand that it tends to perform fairly well when interest rates are low, like they are now. So, you know, it, it hurts them that their term deposit is, you know, at, you know they're lucky to get one and a half percent now. Uh. Um, and they also understand that equities are volatile, you know, and, and Q1 of this year reminded them of that. So um, for a lot of SMSF trustees, sort of making that decision to put five to 10% into gold is, is pretty normal. And increasingly now, we're also starting to see it from financial advisors. Um, now, whether that's client-led, as in the clients just asking enough times, hey, what about gold? What about gold? Um, but we're, we're definitely seeing a lot more of that now. And again, from the advisor's perspective, I can also understand that because, you know, if I was a financial advisor and I was thinking, oh my God, you know, cash rates are sort of negative in real terms. Most of the bond market is negative in real terms. Equities are, you know, look, they're cheaper than they were at the start of the year, but they're not cheap. Like we, we've had a, a more than 10 year bull market in the U S uh, right. you know, the, the ASX, you know, was, was back at 7,000 points. The accumulation index was way beyond the, the 2007 highs. It's, it's not an easy time to allocate capital. So I can see why more investors now are saying, look, you know what, if I put 5 to 10% in gold, you know, it's actually delivered pretty strong returns over the long run. It tends to perform very well when interest rates are low. It, it's been the best hedge against equities whenever equity markets are volatile. And it's and it's gold. Like it's actually quite simple to understand when when you um, yeah. when you sort of when you look at it that way. It, it doesn't surprise me that the appetite uh, for gold is growing. And and I, I think for as long as we remain in a world where rates are low, where there's you know monetary policy stimulus, fiscal stimulus, etc., I, I think you're going to see gold demand continue to stay relatively strong. And like if you look at the ETF space as a as a proxy. Um, and, and obviously ETFs aren't the only way that you can buy gold. But in 2020, we've already seen the better part of like 500, or no, about 450 tonnes come into gold ETFs globally. Our, our product on the ASX, uh, the ticker code for that is, is PM Gold. It's three biggest months for inflows. So forget, forget the change in valuation because of the price just the three biggest months for actual inflows have been the last three months. So February, wow. uh, yeah, February, March, and April. Um, so, and, and the product has grown by basically 40% in 2020 alone. So the demand is very real from, you know, as I say, the SMSF investors increasingly from intermediaries allocating capital for, for their clients as well. When you mentioned that there, I believe that you said it was 150 billion dollars a day that was traded in gold yeah around that that's huge that's just blows my mind um that's not individual investors though is it that would have to be sort of countries trading sovereignly uh yeah so the the, so the 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 liquidity in the gold market is primarily sourced or primarily comes from uh, two areas so you've got the futures market so people trading um, yeah, futures contracts, uh, which are typically set at 100 ounces of gold. So each contract has a, you know, in Australian dollars, a nominal value of about a quarter of a million dollars at today's price in, in US dollars, call it 165 grand. Um, so roughly half the liquidity in the gold market is just futures market trading. Um, and that's that futures market trading effectively comes from two primary sources. You've got actual commercial participants in the gold industry that use the futures market to hedge price risk. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you also have speculators who are just wanting to basically profit from potential moves up and down in the gold market. Um, The second part of the the liquidity or the the other, the other major driver of the liquidity is what we call OTC. So over the counter trading um, and that predominantly takes place or or settles um, with, with trade in, uh, in, in London and so, yeah, that, that, that trading is dominated by some of the world's largest banks. It includes central banks that are trading as well. So, you know, central banks today own over 30,000 tonnes of gold. So roughly 20%, it's, it's closer to 35,000 tonnes. So, you know, bit, being a bit more accurate, it's probably closer to 18% of all the gold that's ever been mined is still owned by central banks today. So that, that in and of itself is a bit of a segue is, is an interesting 
point to, to my view because everyone says, oh, yeah, gold's not money anymore. Well, if it's not money, why do central banks keep, you know, still own 35,000 tonnes of it and use it as one of their primary reserve assets, right? It's clearly because they see it still as, as one of their important monetary reserves. Um, but, yeah, back to, the, back to the, the, the points around gold liquidity, as I say, the, the OTC trading and the, the futures market trading makes up the, the majority of the volume. Um, then you also see uh, trading actually in ETFs, and that might be a couple of billion dollars a day in gold ETFs globally, maybe uh-huh. one, one to two billion. Um, and then you've got the sort of direct trading, which is, you know, for example, clients that are buying and selling through an organisation like ours, the Perk Mint. Um, but, yeah, look, it's, it is... It is an incredibly liquid market and, and that in and of itself, uh, I mean, obviously it's very topical right now in the superannuation space, um, the issues around liquidity in, in, in super funds. Um, and, and I think, you know, if I was a financial advisor and I was looking for investments for my clients, I would want to make, you know, liqu- liquidity and the ease of getting in and out would be uh, of paramount importance to me as well as, you know, potential capital growth and yields and, and, and you name it. Now, obviously, gold doesn't provide the yield, uh, but from a liquidity perspective, you can get in and out very, very, very easily. Um, and, and that's important. So, you know, if you, if you own gold directly with, with an organisation like ours or if you're buying an ETF, you know, there's really no, no challenge, uh, you know, liquidating your portfolio or your holding uh, on, you know, at the very moment you decide you want to and, you know, you have your money back very quickly. So... Um, you know, I think, I think particularly in periods where there's sort of financial market stress and other asset classes freeze up a little bit, that, that liquidity of gold really comes to, to the fore. That's really, really pertinent at the moment, purely based on the fact that uh, Alex Vikovic, who's a, the wealth editor at the AFR, he was just asking on XY uh, earlier today um, about if anyone had heard what he had heard, which is someone was simply trying to roll over their funds from one super fund, I won't mention which super fund, to another super fund, which I won't mention. Uh, But it was found that the super fund would not release the rollover funds purely because everyone is terrified about liquidity right now. There's a lot of money that's getting sucked out of the system due to the relaxations on the conditions of release, which looks to be a temporary measure, which thank God... Um, there are there are reports that the ME Bank, which uh, is the industry super fund bank, has just uh, taken percentages of people's um, offset accounts and just absorbed that into the loan to reduce the risk of their exposure to people's home loans. Which is one argument, but why was why is it? Why is it only the bank that's attached to the industry super funds? I don't know. Maybe it's to help bring liquidity. Who knows? But liquidity is a huge problem right now. And as I mentioned at the start of this podcast, these black swan events tend to be a decade phenomena, right? Like for whatever reason, these once in a lifetime things happen all the time. And so it's something that we're going to be prepared for. And it, and gold is one of those unknown asset classes. And I certainly didn't know it had that level of liquidity. So I wouldn't actually mind asking how, how, what, what is the Perth mints fund under management? If that's the right term, how much, what's, how many, how many, how many millions of dollars is currently invested in the ETF? Yeah, sure. No, so it's a good question. Um, so our, our product on the ASX PM Gold, uh, the market capital, well, the, the market value of that product um, as at the end of April was about $490 million. Yeah, right. um, now, uh, PM Gold is just one of the products that effectively sit in what within what we call Perth Mint Depository. So um, Perth Mint Depository um, you know, we have a mobile savings app, for example, that people can, you know, download the app, start saving in gold. If really? You, yeah, that's right. Now, cool. it's called Gold Pass. Um, now, effectively, if you do that, your the gold obviously stays with us. So that's part of Perth Mint Depository as well. We then offer an online account. Um, people can create an account like a stockbroking account, but for but purely for, for buying and selling precious metals. 
again, that gold stays with us. So that's part of Perth Mint Depository as well. In the, um, you know, the, the, the depository started with a certificate program decades ago. Uh, the total size of the depository uh, in March for the first time ever topped uh, $5 billion Australian for, for the first time. And it's, it's sort of grown in the month since. Um, but yeah, in March for the first time, we, we topped uh, five bill. Um, so from that perspective, you know, the Australian ETF, uh, I suppose, makes up the just about 10% of the, of the, the, the total Perth Mint Depository, uh, not quite. Um, so yeah, that, that gives you, I suppose, a, a, a sense of size. Um, back to your point regarding, um, yeah, I suppose there's just the liquidity issue. I, I think it's an interesting one because, I mean, obviously the entire um, superannuation industry um, was sort of to, to, to one degree or another um, blindsided by the sort of early release oh, yeah, of course. issue. Um, I don't think anyone could have forecast that. No. And look, to, to be fair, even, even COVID, no one knew it was going totally. you know, to flare up the, the way that it has. Um, so look, I, I don't, um, I sort of have some, you know, a lot of sympathy for funds that are, that are facing any, any yes. stresses. I, I think the point that, that we would make, you know, at an institutional level, um, is that you know if you're looking to build up, build out your alternative assets exposure, um, you know most alternative assets, you know look they ha- they have some great qualities that they bring to a portfolio, but they can often be either illiquid, expensive, or a little bit opaque, right? yeah, a, a, or a combination of those. Yeah. Um, you know gold is highly liquid, it's very very simple, and it's very very low cost. Um, so, you know, when we're talking to institutional investors, we sort of say, look, this is the liquid alternative that you can put into your alts basket. Um, when we're talking to direct investors or as even as I say, your, your average financial planner, if I can sort of use the term average financial planner, as I say, in, in most of the interaction we have, m- most, most of those, those uh, professionals, they're not really looking for, you know, private equity deals or VC deals or, you know, unlisted infrastructure deals. It's just, it's just not on the radar. If you, if, you know, if you're, if you're managing client portfolios of, you know, a million, two million bucks max, and in some cases a lot less, it's just not really practical to sort of invest in those asset classes. Um, so from that perspective, gold really comes into its own as an alternative because it's, you know, you can get into gold with as little as 50 bucks, you know, like you don't need, you don't need big licks of capital to, to, to be in gold. If you've got big licks of capital, you can also be in gold because, as I say, it's $150 billion a day, you know, and $10 trillion asset class. But actually, it's, you know, it's accessible for investors starting with, you know, with, with kind of next to nothing in their portfolio. Interesting. Um, it brings two questions to mind. What are the exact GPS coordinates and um, pin number for your safe and your bullion? <laughs> That's the first question. Uh, and the second one is, what is the difference between the PM Gold ETF and the, the one that I had traditionally used and only ever used, which was G-O-L-D on the ASX? So <laughs> what, to, what, what's, what's this G-O-L-D? I believe it's out of Switzerland or something. And then, um, you know, what's the difference? Yeah, so um, you know, for for obvious reasons, I'm not going to answer question one regarding the, the, the um, <laughs> uh, um, regarding uh, regarding I suppose the differences between um, yeah some of the gold exchange traded products on the market. Look, at the the things that we would say about about Perth Mint Gold are, are as follows. Um, first and foremost, it's incredibly low cost, so the MER is only. 15 basis points. So that's substantially cheaper than our competitors. It also is backed by gold that is sitting in the Perth Mint depository. Now the Perth Mint is owned by the Western Australian government. Um, and there is a government guarantee um, that underpins our gold, the gold investments that sit within our depository. So it's the only product on the ASX that effectively has a government guarantee there underpinning the investment. Now that doesn't no. mean the gold price can't go up and down, but no, it's, of course a, not. It's, the it's chances a, of it falling over is impossible. Um, and and the last part is that um, is that it's redeemable now for most investors that buy and sell a you know gold via the ASX via an ETF or an ETP they're, they're probably not looking to redeem it for physical and that's fine they'll just trade it buy and sell it for cash that's that's fine um, but you know from from our perspective there's no better way of demonstrating that there's gold there to to back the product than by allowing people to redeem um, as and when they they like now. Other, a lot of other products will say that they're redeemable and, and, and in reality they are, 
But if you sort of go through um, the detail, you tend to find you actually need to have a bullion bank account in London and you can only redeem in, say, 400-ounce bar form. Now, 400-ounce mm-hmm. gold bar is worth a million dollars mm. at today's price. So in, in effect, it's not practically redeemable for most investors. Whereas PM Gold, our product, you know, if you own 100 units of PM Gold, you have, you have a claim or you can lay claim to one ounce of gold that's sitting with the Perth Mint. So you could actually take delivery in a one ounce coin or a one ounce bar. And over the last, you know, we, we probably average one client every month or so will actually say, yep, look, I want to take my gold bars out of all, I want to convert my product to, to physical metal. And, you know, there's an administration process involved, but it's, it, you know, we do it on a, on a regular basis. So, um, you know, and I suppose if I, can, if I can sort of play the Australia card a little bit as well, um, you know, Australia is the second largest gold miner in the world. The Perth Mint as a refiner refines over 90% of that gold. And we, we refine effectively 10% of the globe's annual gold production. Wow. Right? So the thing I like to say to investors here, it's like, well, if you're going to buy gold, right, why would, you, why would you not invest in Australian gold that is domiciled here? Well, why use it? It's, it's, you don't need to go offshore to get access to this product, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, look, for, for a lot of those reasons, we're, we're finding that the, the popularity, I suppose, of, of the Mint's products in, in all its forms, not, not just through PM Gold, the, the listed products, is, is growing very substantially. And it's across investor, the, the entire suite of investors. So, you know, I mentioned before SMSFs, but even up to, you know, institutional wealth, sovereign wealth funds, you name it, um, you know, the, the appetite for gold investment is, is only growing right now. Interesting. Yeah. Look, if, if I'd known what I know now, because it's been around, this ETS been around for a little while as well, right? Yeah. PM Gold was actually launched back in uh, around 2003. So it's been, um, wow. yeah, it's been yeah. up and running for, for quite some time. And, and the good thing from that is that from an investor's perspective, you can sort of go back and check how close, you know, the fact that it actually has tracked the Australian dollar gold price over that time. Yeah. Um, if I think about the, the counterparty risk, is so low for Perth Mint. I mean, having a government backing, I'd love to see the legislation on that. I'd love to see how airtight that, that, uh, that backing is because I mean, very attractive. Think about there's, a, there's a product that Macquarie produced. It's called, um, act, uh, what is it called? It's some, it's active index or something like that. Anyway, it's used by a lot a lot of um, large, I'll be very opaque in my words, very large financial institutions to get broad-based exposure to the ASX at an extremely low price point. That price point being zero, 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 zero point zero zero MER. Right. And, and the reason why uh, it's so cheap is because the contract is, institution gives money to Macquarie. Macquarie can do whatever they want with it. And their gamble and their bet is that they can outperform the index. So you as the person who gives the money or the entity that provides the funds, you get index, exactly what the index is. Uh, they can do whatever they want with it. However, the, it's, it's, not a, oh, it's called true index, I believe, something like that. Anyway, it's not like a, a Vanguard, right? So Vanguard actually owns the underlying assets. Here, it's a, it's it's the counterparty risk is extreme, right? We're talking in hundreds of millions, probably billions, uh, of dollars are held in this true index, something along those lines, and the counterparty risk is massive, right? And so it would be, and advisors don't know this. Undoubtedly, they've got clients with exposure through different layers uh, of their clients' money have exposure to this, this true active just because it's used all the time because it's so unbelievably cheap. Um, what's interesting is I've never even heard of a, an investment other than banks guaranteeing $100,000 at the time of the GFC per, per bank. Uh, and at the time I was working in a, um, a financial planning company where we would spread uh, the client's money in hundred thousand dollar lots across multiple banks, just because it was guaranteed. But essentially, if if the Western Australian 
government is guaranteeing the um, was backing not only the gold but also the ETF. That gives an unbelievable sense of security. Again, it doesn't improve the the, the returns at all, but in a worst case call it black swan scenario, it's going to be the last thing that dives. Whereas many clients would have exposure to the true index at Macquarie, which could, I mean, the chances of Macquarie collapsing are far higher than the chances of the West Australian government. Um, it almost happened during the GFC and we saw bank banks far bigger than Macquarie collapse during that time. So uh, the, it's, it's, it's interesting to know that the security of that investment is so high um, and it's tradable on the, on, on the ASX and it's lower cost than what uh, the GOLD, the ones that I used to use. Um, so yeah, it's all around. It seems like a, a really good investment. Um, what is the outlook for gold, right? So as I know, as you know better than me, gold typically shoots up in value and then kind of goes flat line or maybe a little bit back or whatever just because it's not sexy enough. There's not enough you know, money going into it when there's not times of crisis. Times of crisis, everyone loves gold. And when it's not times of crisis, everyone gets bored with the gold. So what do you see happening? What's your sort of, and we, no one can read the future, but one of the cool things about gold is the technical analysis, I believe at least of gold is probably a bit more accurate than other companies because- for many, for many reasons that we spoke about earlier, it's a lot simpler of an investment, right? There's not, there's no counterparties. There's, it's just gold. And so the technical analysis, there's less variables to deal with. So you're probably going to end up with somewhat of a more accurate prediction. What do you see as the outlook over the next six to 12 months? I think the, the first point I'd, I'd say um, is that, you know, gold has had a, a, an incredible run in the 18 months to the end of March, gold basically um, put together six straight quarters of positive returns. This is, this is in US dollar terms um, and was up about 40% over that period. Uh, in Australian dollar terms, it was actually up around 60% um, as a result of the, the currency weakening a little bit as well. So to me, it's no great surprise that realistically over the last sort of six to seven weeks, we've more been in a, you know, a period of consolidation. Um, and, and that could continue for a little bit longer. Um, you know, no assets just going to go up in a, in a straight line. Um, except having, Bitcoin. Well, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, well Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes up and down in straight lines. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, uh, so there's, I, I, I'd, I'd make that point. I, I suspect that going forward though, prices are likely to remain biased to the upside. And, and the reason I say that is if you, if you sort of look at the, even just the last few weeks where, where equity markets have bounced back, um, they haven't really bounced back because the economy, you know, economic data has gotten better or because we're, you know, necessarily uh, 100% certain that, that all of the, the lockdowns and, and restrictions on, on, on the movement of people are going to end immediately. It's predominantly been driven as a, as a reaction to the sort of the monetary policy and, and fiscal stimulus that we're seeing, um, you know, deployed across the entire sort of Western world. Now, undoubtedly, those things are, you know, have proved to be over the last few weeks um, bullish or, you know, at the very least supportive of, of risk assets like equities. Um, but you suspect they're also going to continue to be bullish for gold as well. So, you know, if you look at the, um, there's, a, there's a piece of analysis I've done, um, which looked at, again, all the market data from 1971, which when we effectively left the gold standard um, through to the end of 2019. And if you look in, in years where real interest rates, so factoring in inflation, were, were 2% or lower, mm -hmm. um, in Australian dollars, the average return on gold in the calendar years where, where real rates were 2% or less was about 20%. Right, that was that was the average calendar year gain. Hmm. Um, so if you look at gold this year in Aussie dollars, it's up already around around twenty percent. Last year it was up around twenty percent. Um, now a lot of people looked at gold last year and went, "Wow, it's gone above two thousand Australian dollars. It's been an amazing year." It was a good year, but it was a year. You know, it was in percentage terms the gain was kind of in line with historical averages. Um, 
Now, again, there's no guarantee that gold can't fall in an environment of negative um, or low interest rates. It, it can. Um, but, you know, whilst we've still got all this economic uncertainty to deal with, uh, whilst there's concerns about debt monetization, rising fiscal deficits, um, you know, political fragmentation, you name it, um, I think gold's role as a safe haven is, is going to only grow in popularity. And, and I think that the... The second point which reinforces that is, is where bond yields are now around the world. So the, the traditional approach, and, and you've obviously spent you know, as much time in, in financial services as I have, and people listening to this podcast will, will be well aware of it for their clients. You know, the, the traditional approach to you know, defensive asset allocations, as it were, was cash and bonds, right? You know, that, that makes sense. That's what you own to minimise equity market risk in your portfolio. And... You know, over the last 50 years, or for the majority of the last 50 years, that's worked pretty well. Maybe not so much in the 70s, but you know, from the 80s onwards, it's, it's, it's worked terrifically well. But if you look at the market today, I mean, a 10-year bond in, in the US or a 10-year bond in Australia, the, the real returns on these things are negative. Yeah, and that's with, in, that's, with, that's with inflation kind of closer to all-time lows rather than, um, you know, rather than it having it take off already. So from that perspective, you sort of think, well... Even if investors say, look, I just need to broaden out my defensive asset class exposure. So rather than it being, say, 30% cash bonds, maybe it's 25% cash bonds and 5% gold, right? That, it, it might be something as simple as that. And, I, and I'm not saying that you know, everyone should have 5% in gold or 10% or, or it's not for me to give that number. But I think that's how people are starting to change their approach to asset allocation, portfolio management. And for as long as that remains the case, you suspect that's going to be good for gold demand and, and therefore good for gold prices you know, a, 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 you know, in the fullness of time, as it were. You can take the man out of AMP Capital, but you can't take the AMP Capital out of the man. Yeah, <laughs> a very good uh, uh, ending remarks there, mate. Um, if, if anyone wants to reach out, if there's advisors that want to learn more about you, what you do, because uh, I know you write, articles for publications tell us about where people can find out more and then obviously um you know let's finish up on how they can find out more about the perth mint yeah sure so if they if they want to to find me personally i mean i'm obviously always happy to to to, to speak to any any investors and advisors so um easiest way is, is just via email as a starting point so so my email is um jordan j-o-r-d-a-n dot elicio e-l-i-s-e-o um, at perthmint.com, so jordan.alicio at, at perthmint.com. Um, and I'm also uh, pretty easy to find on, on Twitter for, for those of people that use social media. So my um, handle is, is just my name. So it's just at Jordan Alicio. Um, and then for people that want to find out more about the, the Perth Mint advisors um, in particular, uh, the, so, so perthmint.com is obviously our, our corporate website. Uh, and then Within, within the website, there's a section that is entirely dedicated towards our depository product. So people that want to buy directly or use PM Gold, our listed product. Uh, and the, the email address for that, and I, mean, I don't know if you can share this via um, other than just me saying it, um, but it's, um, it's basically perthmint.com forward slash storage. And then that, that basically directs you straight to the section which deals with our depository products. Awesome. Well, mate, it's been, as I said, used to be a bit of a gold bug, but obviously still a bit of a believer. It was great to go back into my superannuation and see that my previous ideas around gold had uh, stacked up well and protected my downsides, which is exactly what you want. So thank you so much for coming on, um, sharing. I don't think gold is spoken about enough in financial services and I really appreciate some of your sort of background coming on to talk to us about it today. So I really appreciate it, mate. My pleasure, Clayton, anytime.